God is good. All the time, God is good. Welcome to our service of worship. This is the second Sunday in Lent, and uh, I'm glad to have you with us today. We um, have a few announcements I'd like to share with you this morning. Uh, one is a congregational meeting that we have coming up on March 14th, so in a couple of weeks, uh, at 1230. And the purpose of our meeting is the election of uh, new officers to serve us, elders, deacons, and uh, nominating committee members. So um, be on the lookout for information about how you can join us for the congregational meeting on the 14th. Um, reminder about our Vesper services that uh, on Thursday evenings in Lent, we will have our uh, uh, live stream Vesper service. So you can join us on our YouTube channel, either at 7 o'clock when we have our service, or you can wait and uh, watch it because it'll archive on YouTube uh, for you to watch it at your own convenience. So I hope you'll journey with us in Lent during our Vesper services. And a reminder, if you have a prayer request you'd like uh, shared uh, for the lighting of a candle at, during the Lenten service, please contact the church office. You can come in on Friday and Saturday this week uh, to pick up communion supplies. We'll be gathering at the Lord's table on March 7th. So uh, if, you have, uh, if you'd like to have a, a taste of First Pres uh, at, as you celebrate the Lord's Supper, uh, please come by and our deacons will be distributing uh, bread and, uh, and juice for you. Um, as always, please be on the lookout for your weekly email for e-news as well as the links that you'll need for Sunday mornings. And I hope you'll join us for our adult uh, Sunday school class. We're looking at uh, believable faith or called believable faith, looking at the books of Galatians and James, uh, tackling some of the questions about uh, what it means to be justified by faith uh, as well as what it means to do good work and what is the relationship between the two. You can also join us for a virtual coffee hour, and we have Sunday school for the kids at 10 o'clock. So as we gather ourselves in worship, uh, let us hear these words uh, from Psalm 22, reading verses 23 and 27. And ponder these in your heart as we continue in our service and we reflect on the promises that God has and what it means to place our hope in them. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all of you offspring of Israel. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. Let us come before the Lord in song. Well, welcome to worship on this Sunday morning. Uh, or wherever you are experiencing it. Our first song is called Here I Am to Worship.
to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross so here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say Our next song this morning is Whom Shall I Fear? You hear me when I call You are my morning song Though darkness fills the night It cannot hide the light Whom shall I fear? Crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind the God of angel armies. He is always no one who reigns forever he is a friend of mine the god of angel armies he is always by my side my strength is in your name for you alone can say you will deliver me Yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies he is always by my side.
always by my side. The God of angel armies is always by my side. And our last song this morning is King of Heaven. Jesus, let your kingdom come here, let your will be done here in us. Jesus, there is no one greater, you alone are Savior, show the world your love. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to save in your mighty name. King of heaven, come. We are children of your mercy, rescued for your glory. We cry, Jesus, set our hearts toward you, that every eye would see you. Lifted high, King of heaven, come now, King of heaven. your glory reign shining like the day king of heaven come king of heaven rise up who can stand against us you are strong to save in your mighty name king of heaven come king stand against us you are strong to save in your mighty name king of heaven come king of heaven come king of heaven come king of heaven come amen In Hebrews 4, we read that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before God, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Let us confess our sins, first silently. And now together, using the unison prayer printed on the bottom of your screen. O oh God, 
We think we love you well on many occasions, but the truth is our love for you is diluted and weak. Our hearts are divided and our passion for your kingdom half-hearted. Our trust in you seems pure only for brief moments. Our affections are drawn away too quickly and our devotion to you dies far too easily. Forgive us. In your deep mercy, rekindle our love for you as we see anew Jesus' love for us. In his name we pray, amen. Indeed, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He has paid our debt. Friends, believe in the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please take a moment to pass this peace of Christ to those with you in your home. You may also extend this peace to others through prayer. The first scripture reading is from Romans 4, verses 13 through 25, which can be found in the New Testament portion of your Bible. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, Faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, Bob and Barb Pappas will lead the time for young disciples. Hi kids, hope you're doing well. In today's Bible reading, we revisit the story of that power couple, Abraham and Sarah. God called upon them to pack all their belongings and move across the country to become parents of a great nation. Now they were already old when God made this covenant. With that if Abraham followed God and obeyed certain rules, Abraham would have a large family, enough to build a country. Spoiler alert, he did. A covenant is kind of like a deal or an agreement. Kind of like 
If your parents tell you that if you mind them and keep your room clean, you can go to the beach next weekend or some other treat. Now, that's a short term for you to keep your end of the deal. Abraham had to keep his end of the deal for a very long time. He was 100 years old when the first baby was born. In the Bible reading today, Paul writes a letter to members of a church who are arguing about which part of Abraham's deal was more important. Remember, he promised to follow God and obey certain rules. Paul tells us that following God is more important because that involves keeping our faith that God will lead us to do the right thing. That is what keeps us going in the right direction for a long time, even as long as Abraham had to wait. Obeying the rules is important too, but none of us is perfect. We make mistakes. So if we focus only on the rules, it would be hard to keep going in the right direction for a long time. Do you think you'd get to go to the beach if you kept your room clean but didn't mind your parents at all? No, I don't think so either. Minding your parents is much more important. And so it is with all of us. We need to focus on following God and have faith that God is always with us and will guide us if we wait, look, and listen. That guidance will help us as we make mistakes along the way. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us stories to remind us of the importance of keeping our faith, even when things take longer and are much harder than we expect them to be. Help us on the right path, guiding us to do all those things that show your love for us. Amen. Our second scripture lesson is uh, found in Genesis uh, chapter 17. We're reading verses uh, 1 through 7 and 15 and 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you extremely numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious God, we pray your spirit to bless our reading, to guide our thoughts, to open our hearts transform our lives, to grant that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be holy and acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're doing in this season of Lent, um, I'm inviting you to reflect a little bit on the journey that we've been on in this last year. Recall that it was during the uh, season of Lent, part way through, that uh, the pandemic uh, was declared and and everything was sort of turned upside down for us. And reflecting on this, I look back at some notes from a sermon that I preached on March fifteenth of last year, which I believe was just a week before we uh, went to um, uh, going online. And. Um, 
I reflected then that everything is turning upside down, that people are dying, that the stock market's been on a roller coaster, uh, there were no sports to divert our attention, no school for our kids who need it, and especially for the children who count on meals at the schools. And recall that everything was turned upside down at that point, and essentially then the learn, learning that we would not be able to get together for worship, which for me at that time was like the last straw. And as I shared with you then, um, I about lost it, actually. And I had texted Corey Schlosser Hall, uh, our Presbytery exec, and I shared something to that effect. And he texted back, and this was in, in my notes, we're going to get through this together and be better for it, with hope, he said, with hope. Now, I've not forgotten that word of encouragement from Corey, and I've drawn on that uh, countless times over the, this last year. Though, when I looked it up recently, I was surprised to see that I had forgotten Corey's mention about hope. We're going to be better for it with hope, he said, with hope. So today what I'd like to do is examine the nature of Christian hope and how it has sustained us throughout this year of pandemic. And so you might be thinking to yourself, and you're welcome to kind of drift off into these thoughts during this sermon to consider where have you seen hope and experienced this hope over the last year? How has this hope strengthened you? And I suppose if we're honest, there might be some places where have you felt that hope has let you down in some fashion or another? How have we leaned on this hope when we may have felt as though we were hoping against hope, which is a term that Paul ascribes to Abraham? As Paul reflects, Reflected in the Romans passage that Becca read, hoping against hope, Abraham believed that he would become the father of many nations according to what God had told him, so numerous shall your descendants be. There's perhaps no better figure in the Bible than Abraham when it comes to talking um, about hope. And as we'll see, his hope though it was not the same as the hope we're talking about in Christ, because, of course, he didn't know Christ at that point. But yet, his hope is a precursor to ours, and we'll explore that here in a bit. Now, when Abraham, known as Abram still at that point, was 75 years old, God came to him with a request and a promise, as recorded in Genesis chapter 12. Go from your country... And your kindred, God tells him, and go from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now note, at this point, actually, we know nothing about Abraham's uh, relationship with God to this point. Um, did Abraham even know God? He certainly didn't know God the way that we know him in Christ. But despite whatever knowledge he had or did not have of God, he placed his trust in the Lord. So by the time we get to the story that we've just read in Genesis chapter 17, actually 25 years had passed, or maybe technically about 24. He was, he was 100 years old at this point, and his wife was 90. Time was running out on God delivering on God's grand promise to make Abraham descendants more numerous than the sand on the beach. They had no children, and God had already rejected their own plan that he and Sarah had devised to fulfill God's promise by uh, Abraham fathering a child born of Sarai's maidservant, Hagar. But if we talk about faith and trust, Abraham overall is truly a model of faith and trust. He believed in what he could not see. He trusted God enough to uproot from his father's house and go to a distant land where God would show him. And he waited decades, decades, for all of this to come to fruition. 
So what kept Abraham going? What kept him believing and, and hoping and trusting in God? Well, it was that trust in God's promises. Whatever it was that was inside Abraham, he believed it and he continued on with it. But make no mistake, Abraham was not perfect. He was not perfect. If you go back and you read the stories of Abraham, you'll see kind of this up and down of his character. There is this incredible trust that he places in God, and yet at the same time, um, when God promises that uh, he will have a, a child, that, that his wife Sarah, who's already old and has not been able to bear any children, that, that she is going to have a child, it wasn't just Sarah that laughed. You recall when the, the angels came, these messengers came, and they uh, were telling Abraham that this was going to happen, and uh, Sarah in the tent listening in kind of laughed to herself of, about what was going to to happen. How could it be at her age that this would happen? But there's another story when God promises the same thing to Abraham, and Abraham himself laughs as well. There's the story, of course, of Hagar that we've, we talked about, where they sort of took matters into their own hands. And then an interesting story that when Abraham and Sarah went down to Egypt because of famine, and they were uh, in, in the presence of Pharaoh and so on, uh, Abraham, looking at his wife, who was beautiful, decided that uh, it would be better if he said that she was his sister, because he was afraid that if they knew that she was his wife, that they would kill him to get to her. And there's a whole story that kind of comes out of that, that God ultimately does protect them, but not on Abraham's own account. But Despite all of these things, he believed in God's promise, God's plan, that it would come true. And so Paul holds Abraham up as an example of faith, of one who places his hope in God. And then for us, an example of justification by faith apart from the law. Paul notes how God had blessed Abraham because, not because of what Abraham had done, but because of what he believed. He believed that God would come through for him. So someone who placed their faith in God prior to, to any giving of the law becomes now the, the father of many nations. All this is by God's grace, which is accepted by Abraham in his faith. Paul's point is this, that if God is willing to bless Abraham so richly, despite the fact that there was no law by which Abraham could be judged, at that point, no law by which Abraham could prove himself. The law would come under Moses many centuries later. But if Abraham could prove himself only by trusting in God, then what is happening is that God is willing to bless even Gentiles, is what Paul is saying, apart from the law, if, if they accept God's promises by faith. And so what Paul tells us is that we are heirs of Abraham and we are part of the promise that God gave him. You might think that we are numbered among the sands of the shore or the stars in the sky, all representing the fulfillment of what God promised to Abraham, a promise first fulfilled through Isaac and much, much later, of course, fulfilled for us through Christ, who would open heaven's gates to all who place their faith and their trust in him. In Christ, we see the fulfillment of these promises. Christ, who is obedient unto the law, and yet who in fulfilling the law points out that the law itself cannot save us because we were not meant for the law, but we are saved because of Christ, who died for us, who rose for us and who lives and reigns for us today. And so the basis for our hope is in Christ Jesus and the cross of Christ, which we'll reflect on more next week. Abraham might have looked at the stars in the heavens or the sand on the shore to remember God's promises and to hold on to that hope. And we ourselves, we would look to the cross to remember the hope that we have in Christ, that he who bore our sins on the cross was raised then from the dead to give us new life. So hope that is based on the cross of Christ 
does not disappoint. And yet at the same time, it does not guarantee us protection from all harm. Still, hope does not die when things are tough. Hope does not quit when the world turns upside down. In this way, Christian hope and faith are somewhat synonymous or at least deeply intertwined with one another. I think we see this in Hebrews chapter 11 and the definition of faith that we find there. Notice the connection between faith and hope. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. The assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. There's another thought or perspective about hope that I found in the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, which offers this about hope that we find in the New Testament. If hope, it's it's written there, if hope is fixed on God, it embraces at once three elements of expectation of the future, of trust, and the patience of waiting. Any one of these aspects may be emphasized. Think about that understanding of hope it's, yes, it's trust, it's expectation for the future, but it is also patience in waiting. Another way to think of that is that unrealized hope is, is still hope. It just takes form as patience. And you recall that patience itself is a gift that is from God, a fruit of the Spirit. So back to what Corey told me, texted me, almost a year ago. We're going to get through this together and be better for it with hope. When I saw that text, it made me feel better. But the question is, why? Why would it make me feel better? Corey had nothing to back up his claim, nothing at all. He could not keep us all safe from COVID-19. He could not provide a vaccine. He could not, had, did not have any special insights into the disease and so on, and he could certainly not guarantee that we would, in fact, make it. But he believed it, and I know he believes it today. And perhaps because of that, I believed it too, and I still do believe it, because his is a hope that was expressed and rooted in Jesus Christ that we will get through, fill in the blank, and we will make it. We will be saved. That our future is secure in Christ's hands. I've thought about this, even as certain things that I had hoped for over the course of this last year never came to pass. Graduations of our two sons, my brother-in-law's wedding, different hopes and dreams that we had for the church, like Vital Congregations Initiative, for instance, and the the work we were going to do there. These different things hoped for that did not come to pass. In reflecting on part of that hope, the things that have helped sustain me throughout this last year, I was sharing with Presbyterian colleagues recently that um, these weekly calls that we had uh, for a large stretch of time over this last year, which are now down to about two a month, these weekly calls by Zoom to get together uh, among Presbyterian pastors and talk and share um, has been invaluable to me. And the opportunity that has provided to um, allow me to get to know some of my colleagues throughout, uh, throughout the Presbytery. Our Presbytery is so vast from the North Olympic Peninsula here to the Panhandle of Alaska all the way out to central Washington. Uh, it's impossible for us to see one another on a regular basis, and yet by Zoom we were able to do just that. And Yet there was something even more that I just thought of actually this week that just came to mind that throughout this pandemic, it's really brought all of our churches in the presbytery closer together. When churches get together and pastors get together and they start talking with one another, there are clear differences. Churches that are in rural areas versus urban areas, maybe uh, Korean language or 
or uh, English language churches, uh, churches that are, have, have large staffs, uh, or churches that have, some churches in our presbytery have fewer members, in fewer actual members than some churches have staff members, for instance. There's a vast difference, and there's so many things that when we get together and we try to talk, we instantly lose interest because somebody will be talking about a problem that they're having and other people are going to tune out altogether. But what, I, what I found in this conversation when we're all stuck in the same situation, not able to worship in person, and everybody's sort of scrambling to find ways to connect with one another, um, well, first of all, I'll pause for just a second to say that when we, people were sharing all these ideas, I was thinking, man, these are all great. I'm writing down all these ideas and things, and I'm realizing that a lot of the things that people shared were not things that, well, we were going to do here. You know, not everybody's ready to tackle Zoom, for instance, or, or you know, the different kinds of technologies that we might use. There's no one solution that's going to work for everyone. And at first, that led me to a great feeling of despair to think, oh my gosh, I, we can't get our people to, to be on Zoom. I have I've so much hope that certain, uh, some of our members would be able to connect by Zoom and, and, and so on, but it just wasn't to be. But there are other ways that we've been able to do that, and we've embraced that. So I went from feeling that despair of what, what we, we couldn't do to realize that we've been given a gift, that throughout this whole time, our churches and our presbytery have found that we have a common mission, which has always been there, to serve Jesus Christ, to proclaim the good news of the world, but we get caught up in all these other things that we forget to, fail, we forget to see that, that central thing. And so now when the conversation began to be about how do we connect with people and how do we proclaim the good news using whatever means that we had, it brought us back to a central point. And I realized that that, that hope throughout this time of upheaval and despair has always been there, so grounded and so obvious for us, and yet not apparent, perhaps until now. I pray that this will give you th th time to think about your hopes and the things that you've experienced over this, this last year and the presence of Christ in your life through so many different upheavals that we've experienced. To reflect on what sustains you, the, the hope that we see in Abraham, the hope that we see sealed in the cross of Christ and the knowledge that we know that in Christ we will be delivered. So consider how has the hope that we have seen in Christ been manifest in your life. And my prayer is as, as you consider this yourself and you look back, maybe you'll have that same sense of aha moment as I had about the churches in our presbytery of opportunities that have come about even in the midst of these things. And friends, that's not by our, our doing. That's by the power of God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, thank you for the example of Abraham who, hoping against hope, held on to the promises that you gave him, held on to them for decades until they would come to pass. And now as we look at the stars and the night sky or we consider the, the sand on the shore, may we consider our place among that promise to feel your promise in our lives, to live that promise and be a place, and people of hope to our world. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. During this time when we are all worshiping in our own homes, please keep in mind that the work of the church continues. You can mail in your tithes and offerings to First Presbyterian Church at 139 West 8th Street, Port Angeles, Washington, 98362. You can also give online by going to the church website and clicking on the link found there. In First Chronicles 2914, King David asked God, but who am I and what is my people that we should be able to make this free will offering. For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. 
in recognition that all we have comes from God, let us freely give back to him. Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen. Friends, let us unite our hearts in prayer. Loving God, we again thank you for the examples of faith and hope that we see throughout uh, the pages of Scripture, but also as we see evident in the people that you have brought into our lives. We thank you for this precious gift that we have of community and, and of prayer, for the promise that you've given us to, to be with us and to hear us, to commune with us. So, Lord, hear our prayer and may we hear your voice as we lift these joys and concerns with you. We pray for... Beth's neighbor, Josie, who has um, a bacterial blood infection, we pray, Lord, for her treatment and for her healing. You would guide her um, doctors and, um, and people looking after her to, uh, to restore her health. We pray continued prayers for Martha's husband, Art, as he uh, recovers from a successful heart procedure. May you continue to uh, give him renewed strength and patience during uh, the healing process. We pray for Sherry's Uncle Bob, who is undergoing radiation treatment. We ask God that you would bring healing for him. We pray for Randy's parents and indeed for... Um, Think of my dad and stepmom and, and others in our church community who are in uh, care facilities. And we pray that you would be with them through the stress and the strain of isolation as uh, so many um, are um, kind of on lockdown and unable to um, be with, with family members um, and cut off for so long from, from that, uh, that support. We pray for Alexander, who is um, suffering from post-concussion syndrome. We ask that you would um, help and heal him in his time of need. Lord, it is with joy that we, we do think about um, the work of your church in the midst of all that is going on and has happened. We thank you, God, for... Um, the work of our elders and our deacons. And indeed, we pray for our nominating committee as they continue the process of um, discerning where you are leading. Um, we pray that people that may be uh, thinking about serving in, in, in a, some capacity or who are asked, that they would um, spend time with you, that they would hear your sense of call and, uh, and follow as you lead. We thank you for uh, the churches in our presbytery and for our presbytery leadership and um, 
the way that you have uh, drawn us together, indeed um, given us hope to get through all of the, that we have experienced, but also uh, to help us and to grow. And thank you for the opportunities that you have brought forward to us, um, as, as painful as it has, has been, uh, the abilities that we have and are developing to be able to continue to connect with people at home and, and wherever they might be, um, even as we look forward to being back together again in person. And so we pray, God, that you would indeed um, open that path for us to be back together. We continue to pray for uh, the efforts to vaccinate people in, in our community and uh, throughout, uh, throughout our, our state and the country. Pray for production and uh, that things would kind of get back online after the snowstorms recently in the Midwest. We ask God that um, you would bless those who are researching and uh, dealing with new strains of uh, the virus that they find in different places. God, we pray that um, we would continue as the body of Christ to sense your presence, to place our hope and our trust in you, and to see indeed how hope abounds. We do see it um, in the, the lengthening of days. Uh, we see it in the signs of, of spring around us. We see it in um, different ways in our, in our families, in our communities. And so help us to tune our eyes to, to these things to keep us strong. We lift our prayer to you, O Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
brothers and sisters, uh, pray that you will go forth into the world holding fast to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the hope that is symbolized in the cross where Christ has offered himself for us. Hold fast to those promises of God and know that the Lord is with us, the Lord is with you. So go in peace, love and serve the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. May the peace of Christ be with you. Amen.